Okay, so after a minor technical delay, we can start now. Um, we'll be talking about security support in Debian and tracking open security issues. Am I understandable, or I hope so. I am Moritz Mühlenhoff. This is my kind, doesn't it? a bit louder. Uh, yeah, okay. A general overview about um, security support in Debian. Um, these numbers are for uh, the year 2006. In 2006, we had 316 security updates issued by the Debian security team. Um, in 2007, it's slightly less, but this is mostly due to the fact that we have set, had some advisories where more issues uh, were combined into an advisory. For example, the recent PHP advisories fixed up to 12 vulnerabilities, while many of the issues fixed in 2006 affected um, only the packages distributed in a single update. Debian um, has a policy of backporting only security fixes, so to isolate the security fix and provide it along with an updated package. It's actually the only um, community distribution which does this consistently. Uh, Red Hat does, does the same, for example, for, the, for um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So does um, SUSE for SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. Um, most other community-based distributions like Gentoo um, normally have a policy of providing the latest upstream version and only backport patches in a few corner cases. We have had relatively few, few functional regressions in 2007. Um, we've had to issue seven advisories again because they broke behavior in one or the other way. In, in 2006, in most cases, these were rather minor issues. Um, for example, the SMBFS regression only affected a fairly minor subset of the user base. Um, likewise, for Mozilla, where, for example, the address book um, functionality of the Mozilla suit browser was broken. You can see that um, the amount of uh, that the share of web applications which had a regression in the updated package is relatively high compared to the others. That's um, partly because um, some of, for example, syntax errors are a lot less um, easier to track um, if you have a ob an obvious um, syntax error in a compiled program. The compiler typically spots it. Uh, for example, in the case of Drupal, um, it was simply a missing semicolon, um, which wasn't really spotted during the tests we made before we issued the update. Debian is certainly one of the biggest distributions. Um, I took these numbers from a talk by Javier a few days ago. Edge has 282 million lines of code. Um, 100, 198 million of these are C and C++. So there's certainly some room for vulnerabilities. The current security team members uh, in alphabetical order are uh, Dan Fraser, Joey Schulze, Noah Meyerhans, Steve Kemp, and myself, plus Michael Stone, but he's mostly backup. You probably won't have seen any advisories from him during the last two years. We have, um, typically, if you send an email to either security at Debian.org or team at security Debian.org, you might either get a reply in very short notice, or it um, may quite uh, also be the case that we're too busy to answer right now. As we get quite a lot of email, um, feel free to, poke, to re-poke us regularly. Um, we get quite a lot of mail, and we often do not have the time to check through old mail again. Uh, we only have time to do that when we have quite a large chunk of time available, like, for example, here during a DebConf. But other than that, feel free to pre-poke us regularly. We don't mind that. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's just the, we don't have much other time to do otherwise. We'll start with um, the typical um, kind of workflow a security problem goes through. And afterwards, uh, I'll raise some issues where Debian can improve. Um, either on technical sides and either on procedural sides. Um, we'll start with the, um, the discovery of a security problem. Um, security information reaches us through many different information sources. 
In many cases, it's um, one of the maintainers notified by upstream. I think this is about um, one-fifth of all cases. I haven't made exact statistics about that. This is just my gut feeling in most cases. We also monitor, of course, all security-relevant public mailing lists. Um, so the most important ones are certainly full disclosure and bug track. We also have, especially in comparison to other Linux distributions, a relatively high amount of security-relevant bug reports from users. As Debian has a technically very competent user base, many of these are able to, to um, dissect, for example, a backtrace and spot security-sensitive changes. Then there's a, um, a central coordination list called VendorSec, um, among which the security teams of many GNU Linux distributions and um, some older legacy Unix distributions, uh, Unix vendors, um, coordinate with each other. This amounts to, I guess, another fifth of all the information we receive. Then there's um, search, which is only used in rare cases. They often only notice us about an issue if it's only known to the public or through other sources. So that's not really that important. Another important um, source of information, especially for the re relatively unimportant or fringe packages, are uh, Mitra updates. Uh, Micah will talk about that later. There are basically two kinds of security information. Um, on the one hand side, there's publicly known information, for example, vendor announcements. In some, time, some cases, there's also um, the situation that someone discovers a vulnerability and puts a certain embargo on it so that we do have the information available but um, cannot update this fixed package until a certain um, disclosure date is reached. It's not that important as, may seem, as it may seem from first hand. Most of these issues um, are issues that come through VendorSec. Um, my gut feeling is that only up to 20% of all information which leads to a Debian security update is coming through one of the embargo channels. Once we've known um, about a security problem, typically the maintainer is notified. And if you have heard of a security um, problem, either from us or from a um, public, public source of information, um, be careful what to do with that information. Most of these vulnerability, web, vulnerability websites, for example, Secunia, do not put very much research in it. They find a new issue, open up um, an entry in the database, and then they typically only add um, advisories issued by vendors. So that's few research actually put into it. Be very careful with it, especially when trusting um, the affected versions. They often put um, affected version entries in it which do not match reality. Be careful with that, check the source for yourself. Also, do not trust security news sites or general news tickers. Most of them only um, copy the typical um, announcement information, paraphrase it a bit, and do typically not provide additional information. The only notable exception that I've put here on is Linux Weekly News. Their um, security updates are quite solid and you can really work with that. Likewise, do not trust the metro descriptions. Um, Micah will come to that as well. There are, there's uh, quite a lot of work involved in um, producing a security update. Um, it is very recommendable to support us by producing a security update. You can prepare patches, which helps things a lot, because um, we um, do not need to work ourselves into a code base we don't know before. Um, especially if it's a more complex packages, you might be a lot more um, familiar with the source code. So preparing patches, sending to us for review, helps things a lot. Um, it's also very helpful to test patches for us. Um, because in many um, setups, especially if they're a bit more complex, it's quite hard to do that. For example, imagine um, a complex Kerberos problem. Most of us do not have a Kerberos setup at home. Likewise, for, um, for, for example, driver updates or complex software like voice over IP solutions. In many cases, we have to rely on the maintainer to test that for us. 
what you can also do is get in touch with upstream. In many cases, upstream should know best about the code base. Um, they should be the ones um, who can provide information. And typically, the maintainer has a better relation um, to upstream than we do. So their mails are probably replied to earlier. And um, you might also be more familiar with the information flow inside um, the upstream project. Also, um, you can help us understand the vulnerability, um, especially if um, a software is more exotic or if it involves technology we don't have very precise information about, for example, Bluetooth, then it's quite helpful if you help us understand what the vulnerability is also quite about. We can research that information for ourselves, of course, but um, in general, the maintainer should, be the, should have the main expertise in those issues, so it's quite helpful to provide this to us. You can also check which suits of Debian actually affected. For example, if uh, a certain piece of vulnerable code isn't built in the SART version, for example, or if um, it's, or maybe if um, other surrounding factors help mitigate an issue. Yeah, I, I think I already mentioned the second point. Um, the more exotic an issue is, um, the more you're inclined to help. I've read many uh, things about team maintenance, praising it as being the silver bullet to Debian maintenance at large. Um, I cannot share this feeling for security problems. Um, we often run into um, situations where unpleasant tasks like preparing a security update or doing this, uh, or maybe testing a security update or helping understanding it um, is shifted to another one. So, um, oh great, we're a team. So. Um, Hopefully, one of the other team members will do it. Um, we've had, we've, we have maintainer groups for up to 20 people inside Debian, where no one ever bothers to update, for example, to follow up a security bug report. I guess, and I think I've heard that before from some blog entries, that some of the RIS team members have had similar experiences. So I suspect this is not limited to security problems at all. But I think there's also a solution which can be put uh, down to mitigate that. For example, um, one could designate a kind of um, group contact for such more important issues um, inside group. Another solution would be um, to more aggressively drop packages which are poorly maintained um, from the archive. So if um, there's poor cooperation, for example, during the, the lifetime of Edge, to just drop, um, just drop the package for Lenny if things don't improve. The BTS um, has a security tag and has different severities, but these are not terribly important for um, rating the effect um, of a security problem. Most people um, are a bit confused by the descriptions which are put um, on, um, the bug, on the BTS help site. Um, in generally, um, whether an issue has been filed with a grave severity or a, an RFC severity at all um, does not change things for us very much as we still um, uh, try to understand these issues on our own and rate the severity differently. But the BTS is a very good place to store all the relevant information. So if you have opened a bug report about a special security problem, please CC um, it all the time so that all the information is kept on a central place and archived so that we can go back, for example, if um, a different issue, which is still um, somehow related to the original issue, happens again, it's quite easier to find for us. And um, most cyber security updates don't close bugs. I'm not sure if this is a technical problem, um, but in general, um, Please, if you as a maintainer have a security bug, um, please use the version BTS to close them with a proper suit. Pardon? I think it would be um, better if we... Closes in the bug, uh, in the change log? Usually, so they're not closed technically or you just don't put the closes in? Um, we've had issues where the closes inside the change log didn't work for stable security updates. Um, and I haven't put that very much work into that. I'm not quite sure whether it's a technical problem or just. In general, um, we just issue an update. Um, so please use the version closes to, to mark them for, uh, for the correct suit. 
Vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities are generally triaged by uh, importance. Um, while you may be the maintainer of this package, please understand that there are other security problems at all also, and also that there are other packages behind your package. Um, we also have to look at the general picture. There may always be issues which are more important. In general, um, while the install base is of course important, um, there are also um, the, more, the much more important factor is to look at the ramification of a security problem. So, for example, we had the case about a year ago where some signal handler-related races um, were found in OpenSSH, while um, the OpenSSH Kerberos version theoretically um, had potential for code injection due to a double free. The OpenSSH plain version without Kerberos support wasn't affected. It was only a mere DOS. So we put um, the OpenSSH Kerberos facts way before the OpenSSH update. Um, although OpenSSH Kerberos 5, um, I think, has only 100 users installed, while OpenSSH is, of course, present on nearly all other systems. There are, all, uh, there are often um, denial of service um, security problems. These are a bit hard to judge. Um, sometimes, um, especially if there's a company who is um, earning money on selling security information, always likes to label um, a regular bug as a security problem. So um, if you have, for example, a denial of service bug, which leads, for example, to a crash, um, one should look very carefully whether this actually has security relevant um, uh, ramifications. We normally always fix these for high profile server applications. So obviously, if you can crash Apache with a single um, HTTP request, this is obviously something which needs to be fixed. If there's a way to crash your browser with a specially malformed HTML page, you would need to trick the user into visiting and browsing it. Um, this is much less of an issue. Actually, we don't fix that at all. So if a user runs into such a website, which makes his browser crash, he will simply not visit this page again. There's nothing, uh, nothing, um, uh, nothing lost except maybe his browser history or something. So these are borderline cases. With 200 million lines of C and C++ code in the archive, you obviously cannot fix all simple crashes. C is simply not made for this. In many cases, um, you also probably need to, um, uh, need to design your setup a bit more carefully. Um, for example, if you have an application which processes untrusted data, you should probably um, put in line a second filter or simply um, fix your setup so that the effects of a, of a crash in one part of your setup does not have um, bad effects for the application at large. Many of these um, crashes are also fixed as generic bug fixes for your stable point release. I will come to that later. You, from time to time, you might notice um, security updates from other vendors where you wonder why um, Debian does not issue an update for that. Sometimes a uh, security problem is just so unimportant that uh, we do not it, um, we do not put out an update for that. Um, even if um, even if the um, the update itself may be relatively harmless, it still has um, the downside that um, the admin needs to look at the update and needs to spend time on installing the update. It takes away attention from other more serious issues. Because, for example, if you have, see an Apache vulnerability every week, while five of these may be very, very minor, um, you simply take away attention from the really serious one which the admin uh, may want to install immediately. Also, um, despite all testing and QA, you still have the inherent risk of, risk of regressions um, for each update. Um, so putting out a security advisory for something which is not really a security problem does not serve the users very well. For example, there have some, I searched out two examples. Um, one vendor fixed a um, denial of service vulnerability in libpng for the part of syslinux which displays a boot up 
PNG logo. So if you have an attacker which is able to compromise um, the central boot directory where the PNG is placed, you have much worse problems than a DOS uh, in, the, in the code which displays the boot up logo. Likewise, some vendors fix buffer overflows in GDB where um, running a binary in GDB may cause a buffer overflow in some ELF sections, which is actually not that much of a security problem because if you feed someone a malformed binary, you have much more easier ways to execute code if he just executes the, um, the binary inside GDB. Um, concerning um, updates and updates which are not issued, um, we'll now move on to non-free. In general, there's no security support for non-free. While um, the security fact implies that security updates may um, be issued if, t if um, it's provided to the maintainers. There haven't been very many cases of non-free DSAs in the last years. The main reason for that, um, I can only speak for myself in that regard, is um, that whenever, as long as there are open uh, security problems in free software, I'm unwilling to spend, um, spend my, my spare time on non-free software. And I have the feeling that most other security team members do the same, do feel the same. So um, currently it's um, not, I, I don't think it's a very um, good solution that we ship a lot of non-free and really risky non-free software in, the, in our archive right now. For example, the Mad, Mad Wi-Fi drivers, um, I think they, they allowed um, code execution by scanning for a certain access point or by, by certain beacon frames. Likewise, the NVIDIA driver, the non-free ones, which were affected by a, an integer overflow in the general code for the, um, for the 3D driver, which was indirectly even exploitable if you just visit a malformed web page and display a specially crafted image. Likewise, for Flash, which has secu uh, serious security problems all the time, um, so my recommendation would be um, that either a group of dedicated volunteers provides some kind of um, security support for non-free um, or that we either drop these at all. Providing security support for non-free has also massive um, handling problems. Um, Red Hat includes the Adobe Acrobat Reader in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux product and Adobe decided to raise the dependency on libgtk from lib from uh, 2.2 to, to, to 4 during the lifetime of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 3. So they um, had to backport a complete version of GTK 3, which is only used for Acrobat Reader inside Red Hat Enterprise Linux 3. So this is not something we really want to achieve, I guess. Many of these um, non-free uh, vulnerabilities are fixed in point updates eventually, but um, one should also point out that these point updates appear a lot less frequent in comparison to regular security updates. We also defer some minor issues uh, into point updates. Once we've finished with the discovery step of a security problem, we now move on to actually building the update. There's a separate security build D network. Once the uh, updated package is uploaded to the security host, all the other portables are handled in the security build D network. If you help us with preparing a package, please do not upload to Clacker directly because um, if there's something broken with a package or we need to fix something, the um, the process of revoking a build is quite difficult, so we normally would have to raise the version number by another time, by another version uh, increment. So please don't do that. Please send us a dev diff. We'll look at it, and if it's all right, we'll tell you to upload. Once the builds have been uh, built in the security building network, they are signed by the security team members and um, uploaded to the security host. That's actually one of the reasons uh, for certain drawbacks. If you notice a um, DSA which lacks one or two architectures, this is typically due to um, problems with the build host. The problem is that um, most of these build D issues cannot be fixed by ourselves, 
and about two thirds of all security built these are run by two persons, which are typically very busy. So um, it always takes a bit of time and prodding to get the build change route fixed. So this is a kind of inherent release, uh, inherent um, problem to release all archives in all architectures in sync when a security update is released. But it does not happen very often, so it's not, not much of a problem, but a bit more redundancy would certainly be nice. Then we can have a look at the build times. Um, we can see here, this is from an older build, I think it's a year ago. Um, it was for KDE base. The build times for M6AK were about 10 times slower than all the other architectures. ARM, uh, as you may see here, is still bad. It would certainly be nice if we had a faster um, ARM security build daemon. I'd asked before, and I think there were some offers, and there are faster machines available. So this would allow us to actually uh, speed up security updates a lot more if we had a faster ARM admin. M68K also had other issues, despite um, the mere fact that the ARC is slow. Um, for example, we once issued an update for Firefox. For Firefox, you upload the package. After six to eight hours, S390 and AMD64 have built. Then you wait another day, and most other architectures, except M68K and ARM are built. Then you wait another day and, or two, and ARM arrives. Then you wait three days and four days. And then finally, you receive a mail that the build failed on M68K because it ran out of disk space. And then you ask the build admin, why is this the case? And then it says, oh, we only can use some very ancient SCSI hard disks that are no longer in that are no longer publicly available, so we need to dig them up at email, so at eBay. So it really, really had some major issues, and I think right now it's quite an improvement because it allowed us, for example, to do the um, security updates for Mozilla a lot faster um, than we used to do for the search times. And it uh, only had 10 users. If you look at Popcorn for the M6AK users, there were always uh, there were no no. no um, more than 10 users at any time when I looked at it. So it's not really that a lot of the potential Debian user base was kicked out here. Once um, an update is complete, an advisory is sent out. Um, you should always subscribe to Debian Security Announce. While Debian Security Announce is broadcasted to many other uh, multiplication factors like news websites, vulnerability databases, it's, it's always recommendable to um, subscribe directly to the announce list. And um, you should not rely on the web uh, advisory overview. This is mostly intended for um, yeah, historic data or maybe looking up which, which issues, uh, which updates were issued at a central point of time. We have a fairly large target audience. We have 33 30,000 um, subscribers to DSA alone, um, plus a lot of multiplication. Bugtrack alone has another 50K subscribers. Uh, so Debian security update reaches quite a lot of people. The web advisories um, are now integrated into web WML, uh, like the rest of the Debian website. Um, hopefully this will be automated more right now, because right now we need to convert the text advisories with a script and upload them via CVS and it's quite annoying. That's also the reason why um, we sometimes forget to add them. So if you wonder why in um, why the web overview a certain DSA is missing, that's because it's an additional manual step which can easily be forgotten. And it doesn't matter that much because the canonical source as said should be the, the subscribing to um, the DSA mailing list. We are sometimes asked why we don't provide severities in our advisories. Um, I don't think that makes a lot of sense because um, the application usage scenarios vary too much. Um, while some issues uh, may be important, um, maybe more important in a different setup than others, um, you should judge that on your own. In general, uh, we, recommend you, we recommend to install all security updates we issue. We have a kind of implicit, um, implicit severity rating as more important issues are uh, released faster or prepared faster. But other than that, we do, not, we do not put explicit severity taggings in the advisories. 
Often you may also have uh, local effects which mitigate the uh, effects of a security problem. For example, the recent uh, Zamba vulnerabilities were not much of an issue for many people because the um, because it only affected untrusted users. Well, um, this is typically not um, the case for a local LAN where Zamba typically operates. The same vulnerabilities would have been much more grave if they would have affected an application like, for example, Apache, which is actually meant to, um, to be exposed to the wider um, untrusted target audience. There were some um, proposed new features and apt. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, you should always read advisories. Um, in some, time, some cases, it may be inevitable that we break existing behavior, so um, we need to be able to document that so that you can react locally depending on your setup. An example for that is the pseudofix, which changed the behavior of, um, of environment variables. It broke some setups for people who did not read the advisory text, which actually explained how to fix your pseudo configuration. There are some kinds of questions directed to the security team, which we often do not have the capacity to answer. So if you have a uh, end question about secure programming or asking for an audit of your program, there are more specialized lists for that. For example, Debian audit, if you have um, general questions about setting up a secure um, environment using Debian, use Debian security at list Debian org. We have a new feature in uh, Duck, which was implemented by Anthony Towns. I've put it into effect, um, well, it was put into effect already a few months ago, but we now also have an overview page. Um, it basically differentiates between issues which are embargoed, which are um, still under embargo date and may not be disclosed. This is um, essentially the same handling as was used before. So. Um, until now, the um, security queue isn't visible to the outside. We now have a separate queue, which is called the unembargoed queue, where all publicly known issues are present, and from which um, we also generate a status page, which actually uses the same code um, like the new queue code. It actually still says um, new and by hand packages somewhere, but this will be fixed sometime. Right now, it's mostly a preview, and it will be moved to the proper uh, security Debian or costs eventually. Sometimes we have a case that um, an issue is embargoed initially and the embargo date is disclosed. For example, because someone has lifted the embargo before the proposed embargo date or because um, the Debian update is not yet ready. We also have the possibility um, to unembargo an issue, so to move it from the embargo to the unembargoed queue. Right now, if you look at that um, URL, you will find, for example, a uh, Mozilla update for Sarge. This actually has been known for a couple of weeks now, so it's present in the security queue. It's also, um, this feature is also useful if you're a maintainer and have worked with us to provide a security update. Then you can see which architectures have already built and which are available. We're having security support for testing since, um, I don't know, maybe one and a half years. It started, I think the first um, step started. Secure testing has certainly improved tracking and transparency of security problems in uh, testing, but it still has not managed to um, produce production quality security support for testing. Many um, issues are in, unfixed in unstable for too long, and we also often have major um, transitions which, for example, um, the recent glibc transitions which prevent security fixes from entering. There used to be a mechanism to provide um, security updated packages especially for testing and copy them to a different suit called testing security. These, um, this, this process is quite complicated, so it wasn't used very thoroughly and it's also quite um, there's also been quite a lack of manpower in that regard. So we met um, a few days ago and um, proposed some fixes which should be implemented. Right now, advisories are sent out 
for each issue. Um, this will probably be replaced by a tool called Debsecan, the Debian Security Analyzer, which is already in the archive. Debsecan allows you to check um, your currently installed system base against open vulnerabilities. Um, Micah will um, present it later as well. Then there are some technical improvements to um, allow the easier production of, um, the easier creation of security updates. And um, I think we also um, proposed that it would be interesting to, um, to relax the rules for NMUs for security problems so that uh, sloppy maintainers might not have security problems unfixed in SID for too long. Right now, in comparison to um, several other security, uh, to several other Linux distributions, Debian has less hardening features um, implemented in the stock distribution. We basically only provide the ones which are present upstream in either the kernel or in glibc. Um, hardening features mitigate the effects of both unknown exploits and also um, which addresses the problem of vulnerabilities or zero-day security problems we don't know about yet. And also um, mitigates the effects of security updates which not, have not been installed by the local admin. One of the problems, um, I've only looked briefly into that, um, but that's the state of affairs as, I've, as I know it, is that um, some of these hardening features are not available across all our architectures. And I think we should improve um, to that for Lenny. Um, one should also note that um, security hardening features are not a silver bullet. Um, often you'll have the problem that um, a vulnerability which is suitable for code injection will simply be turned into a DOS vulnerability because an assert is placed or the system simply terminates if it um, notices an an attempt to allow code injection or to, to inject code. Fedora and um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux are fairly good into that, into that regard. I think um, two interesting features which could be implemented for Lenny are for once fortified source, which is present in um, Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux for I guess two years now. And um, also the um, the stack smashing protection from GCC, which is upstream in GCC since, I guess, 4.1. Um, it's based on Propolis by IBM, and likewise, as Fortify Source, is used in Fedora and Red Hat, which has the nice benefit that many of the bugs unveiled by these hardening features are already fixed upstream for one of the maintainers in Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But one should also know that um, the security problems, the security team will not have the resources to manage that all by our own. So this would need an interested group of uh, volunteers who coordinate things and who are interested in coordinating with maintainers, checking that the necessary features are applied and also look into uh, eventual bugs that arise from these problems, uh, from these features. I think we also need um, properly maintained errata. Many other Linux distributions have that. So um, currently we only have errata um, inside the installation manual. Um, we document known bugs with the installer, but we do not uh, properly maintain errata for all the problems which are discovered during the lifetime of a stable release. This is not only um, useful for security bugs, but also for um, general bugs affecting users as well, which cannot be fixed uh, in a stable point release. We could, for example, uh, use this security-wise to document um, software which is so broken that you can no longer use it at all, or uh, maybe document cryptographic advances, or document new, uh, newly arrived weaknesses. This um, would need a maintainer. I think uh, there was a proposal to do this in a wiki, but the wiki, I think a wiki has quite some problems with that. I think the best way would um, be to have a volunteer who can be CC'd. So if there's a discussion through email um, that something needs to be added during the errata, and that this person can simply be CC'd, or maybe a whole maintainer group maintaining these errata. 
But I think that's really an interesting point because it allows us to, um, to document all shortcomings we cannot fix. There's also some infrastructure improvements that would be um, quite desirable. We sometimes have the problem that we need to search for um, specific source code um, file inside the whole archive. Right now, um, packages Debian org only allows you to search for the contents of binary packages. It does not allow the same for source packages. That would be really cool. Some people have also been working on um, whole level source level grabs or binary fingerprinting. Florian Weimer once made um, a complete archive scan um, using ClamAV. He searched for copies of um, libxpdf. Um, which was vulnerable and embedded in quite a lot of applications. Um, so having a general infrastructure for that would also, also help, especially with more complicated security problems. And I already mentioned um, that web advisories should be handled more automatically. There's, all, there's um, already some existing code, I guess, in DAC for that, so maybe this just needs to be improved. Another problem um, which is giving us headaches since some time is the archive growth. Um, if you package an archive, um, please th think about that not every package is necessarily a benefit. We're about, we are about at about 15,000 packages right now, and if the current growth rate, growth rate persists like it is right now, um, we'll run into much more severe problems. Especially um, be careful if you load image software. If you upload um, some network-related code or web applications, um, be very careful um, if you upload pre-releases or test versions, you know, to be buggy. Especially if it's um, just a few months ahead to the next stable release. We have quite some broken software in Edge which was just released, which was uploaded um, quite shortly prior to the release so that the problems in these applications were only noted after the release. Um, yeah. Some examples, um, if you search for minimal with app cache, you will find hundreds of services which implement a well-known network service in a minimal way which is known to be secure and um, with a low, food, low memory footprint. Um, we typically, if you, if you want to package the 18th HTTPD, which is a minimal HTTPD, uh, you should think whether it's actually a benefit. It's not only um, because of the added, uh, added overhead for maintaining all these packages, but it's also quite difficult for an, administrator, for an administrator to make an informed call which of these 17 HTTPDs is actually good. Because um, if he doesn't know, he would actually need to test all 17. So it's much, uh, I think it's uh, much more reasonable to limit the choice in some fields of application inside Debian. Of course, we are the greatest distributions, but um, sometimes we also need to limit ourselves because otherwise things get out of hand. Another problem with fringe packages is that they don't receive very much um, review. They are typically written by one author. Um, no one else looks at them if it has only five users. It's quite unlikely that one of these five users is doing a security review of these package. Um, likewise, they will probably not be noted by security researchers, so um, that's another reason to be careful. Be extra careful with network-related code. This is actually um, related to the 17th minimal HTTPD I've been mentioning. You may think that um, some software is just secure, but even Ed, the classical editor, had a security problem. Um, it was a temporary which would potentially allow overwriting others of overwriting other files of the user. So um, in general, every package may have a security problem eventually, although it's of course more likely for web applications and network related code. Another problem is um, that many maintainers only uh, focus on their specific pack pack pet package. Um, they might, need, uh, they might um, have a short time interest in that package because it looks cool, and their package lose interest after half a year and then it's still stuck in the archive and we need to support it for at least 30 months. So if you select a package, um, please think of that the resources to fix security problems are not endless. Um, each advisory takes at least two hours of work. For more complicated advisories, like for example the, 
recent PHP updates, it can cause up to 20 hours of work. So be extra careful. Um, if you want to have a package in the archive and want to have it properly, properly maintained, this also creates some work for others. Also make sure um, that a package is supportable for 13 months. We have release cycles. We have estimated release cycles of one and a half years. Once a release has um, been released, it receives another year of old stable security support. So it would have to go with at least two and a half years of security support. If your application is so volatile that upstream um, doesn't care even after two months, or that they only recommend to package the latest version, it might not be a suitable candidate for a stable release. There's a separate BOF um, on the supportability of 15,000 packages. Um, last time I checked in Panther, it was um, Thursday at a quarter to 10 in the lower BOF room. So if you're interested in that topic, um, you should probably attend that. The positive side is that review um, of maintainers at large sometimes, work in, uh, sometimes works. We once had a, a CGI script in the archive for, which allowed web-based password changes. Um, it was already at version four and was um, available since four years. One would think that um, a central piece of code which allows password changes was, quite, um, was coded with great efficiency and was carefully reviewed. But um, once it was uploaded in the archive, um, one user noted that um, the privileged username is taken from a forwarded environment variable, um, filed an RC bug, then other people looked at it and found several buffer overflows, and this package never even made it into the testing distribution because an RC bug was filed immediately, and I think it was removed uh, three months after the initial RC bug was filed. The funny side story of that is that later on upstream complained that Debian was too demanding because they were insisting on having secure software which allows web-based password changes. I've already mentioned um, web applications. Web applications are in comparison to um, traditional compiled code a lot more volatile. They also have less dependencies because they're typically run inside a, a HTTP environment and are not necessarily tightly coupled to system libraries. They often have the problem that new attack schemes uh, require rewrites of the whole code base um, to focus on new attack schemes. It's not as simple as many traditional vulnerabilities where you just need to um, impose additional sanity checkings or boundary checks. Upstream is um, often less experienced, so we have a um, often have um, upstreams who cannot really dissect a secure problem on their own, and the upstream fix can be less trusted. And it's also notable that um, many of these web applications are also um, packaged by, by maintainers who are less experienced, uh, notably often by people who are fresh from the NMQ. So be careful um, when sponsoring a web application and make sure that you're able to, um, to fix up eventual problems which arise from the fact that a that such a package was uploaded. There are about um, 10 to 20 web applications in the archive which have a really disproportionate share of security problems. Uh, Mike, I will note that again later as well. Um, with web applications, we also have the problem that they, most of them do not release patches for security problems, but just complete new upstream versions. So we have to dissect the whole um, new up, the whole interdiff and check um, which security fix uh, was done inside the whole release. Upstream coordination is much more difficult, and some upstreams don't even know the concept of a patch. If you look at the website of a very popular um, web-based bulletin board system, they release patches which are described like, then please enter text file such and such, go to line 360, add these four lines, then go to line 317, relete, delete the next three lines and put the next four lines in. So if you have an upstream which does not even know what a patch is, then it's quite unlikely that they are able to release quality patches for that. So we have a, def, certainly have a quality problem here. Another problem is that, um, Few other distributions uh, package 
that many web applications. Several of these web applications are only present in Debian, except from sometimes Gentoo, which only um, release the next new upstream version anyway. So coordination with other vendors and patch sharing is also quite difficult. I think um, the proper fix would be for about 10 to 20 of these packages, which are really um, causing a lot of work, um, to move them to volatile instead, because that pretty much matches their usage pattern. Even main, uh, most of the maintainers uh, maintaining such software um, often tell us that they're using the SID version anyway. So um, it's also quite difficult to get the maintainers to properly act together and in preparing a, a fixed update. With many web applications, um, there's also the phenomenon that, the phenomenon that um, many of these may very well be limited um, to an authenticated HTTP zone. For example, we have SQL Ledger in the archive, um, for which we decided along with the maintainer that um, the, the way SQL Ledger is supported is that it's only supported um, if run inside an authenticated HTTP zone, because it's a, um, it's a double double-based accounting solution. This is not something you would typically put into the public internet for everyone able to success. So I think for many of these web applications, it might um, be a proper solution to just document that this package um, is only supported for a certain field of application and not um, at large for any application you'd ever possibly think of. Now I'll um, talk about um, three notable packages um, which are um, a bit different from the typical um, packages which cause security problems. The first one is PHP. You should note, um, if you run uh, an application written in PHP, you should um, have a look at the readme Debian security file, which describes the scope of the security, so the security support presented for PHP. PHP does not have a sandbox mechanism, for example, as Java has one. So um, we don't treat security problems which allow code injection as security problems if they, are, um, if they are only exploitable through arbitrarily executed PHP scripts. We treat these only as security problems if they can be triggered through a web application. Sean Finney, um, the currently, uh, currently the most active and actually um, I guess the, the sole PHP maintainer is planning to integrate the Suazin hardening patch from Stefan Esser of the PHP Harden project into our mainline PHP distribution. It, uh, it currently has some problems due to architecture compatibility issues, um, but I guess once these are ironed out, um, this will be a proper solution which helps us to, um, to mitigate some of the effects we have right now inside PHP. PHP often literally has a um, steady flow of security problems, and they also um, have quite some problems in their proper upstream security management process. The good thing for Lenny is that we were able to, um, to remove PHP 4 from the archive. Actually, it is currently being removed, but um, this will relieve us from maintaining both um, versions at once, because um, according to my experience, about every second um, vulnerability found in PHP 5 affects PHP 4 as well. So that's quite an overhead because we need to um, backport security fixes for all um, PHP security issues to the Edge version of PHP 5, the Sarge version of PHP 4, and the Edge version of PHP 4, which is quite an overhead. Mozilla is another um, software group which has regularly frequent and grave security problems. Um, for uh, the Sarge Mozilla packages, we were still doing isolated security fixes which were backported. For Edge, we decided to um, go along with the point releases released by Mozilla because um, the steady flow of security fixes is just too large. Another problem is um, that it's really hard to get people to test these updated, these packages with isolated security fixes. The latest um, Mozilla 2.0.0.4 version, for example, fixed um, 38 security problems. This is not something you can realistically backport um, in a reasonable time frame with a sheer volunteer project. Shipping micro releases also has the, the benefit that we profit from all the QA done um, by the Mozilla group. 
Um, right now, for, for example, for the latest round of Mozilla updates, we haven't um, heard of any regressions. The only one was that some iStuff extension, uh, extension, which is the, the free version of Thunderbird, um, had a st too strict dependency on some Trabif widget, but really nothing serious. So this actually works well. For Lenny, um, Mike Homie and the other uh, Mozilla maintainers are working on integrating um, Xul Runner, which is um, a kind of Mozilla library, into all the other packages so that we need to um, fix all these security problems only in Xul Runner and do not need to um, issue all the updates for Thunderbird, Mozilla, and uh, Firefox in together. If you have a really security-sensitive environment, um, it's recommendable to run uh, Mozilla or um, Ice Weasel without uh, JavaScript support. Many of the JavaScript, uh, many of the corru memory corruption vulnerabilities potentially leading to code injection are actually um, introduced by one or the other bug inside JavaScript. And many of the web logic security problems can also be mitigated by disabling JavaScript entirely. The kernel has a, um, some, people, some people think that the Linux kernel is uh, way too insecure. While there may have been a phase a few years ago where quite a lot of local privilege escalations um, have been found, this has significantly become better. Um, there were actually only very few local privilege escalation uh, vulnerabilities found right now. The last one was also fixed very quickly we were actually the first um, Linux distribution to provide a fix for that. Um, there was the case that um, someone posted a, um, a zero-day exploit to full disclosure on a Friday afternoon, so this hit all the um, security teams of the commercial distributions pretty badly because they're already in the weekend, but it's actually the time where we have the most spare time available, so this was quite a coincidence. Um, most of the issues um, fixed in the Linux kernel are local denial of service vulnerabilities. Many of these will not affect you. If you have a really complex multi-user environment, um, they may affect you, but many of the vulnerabilities labeled as local denial of service should not be a security problem in most environments. We still fix them anyway, of course, because there are always the 10% the of setups which could be uh, affected by those. There will be updated XORG and um, Linux kernels with security support roughly, um, I think it's not decided yet, 9 to 12 months after the Edge release, so that um, people who need to run um, Debian Edge on a more current hardware have more recent um, driver updates available. There's a buff on that on Thursday as well, but I think it wasn't quite sure yet. Uh, on? It's at three o'clock, yeah, it, somewhere here in the in the Taviot, probably. Um, sometimes people raise the issue of um, enterprise support cycles. Enterprise support cycles are typically described as support cycles of five to seven years. This is um, technically feasible. We certainly have the know-how to do that. Um, Woody had more than four years of security support because the SART release was delayed quite quite long and um, we, had a, we had still had another year of all stable security support. So we were able, actually able to um, provide security support for the whole Woody release for four years. Um, right now for Edge, with our current resources, I don't think that's longer feasible. Um, it would certainly be possible for a selected subset. So by not um, providing security support for all the main servers in the archive, but by only limiting it to, for example, XM and Postfix and to the base distribution and typical server systems. Because I guess that's typically the environment people um, may want to run, to run in a five to seven year time frame. Still, um, this will not be able with, um, the, with a pure volunteer based um, security team at long. So um, this would only be possible if some um, company who is interested in providing um, service level agreements for five to seven years, um, this company would need to invest manpower to actually make this happen. We don't, I don't believe we have the resources to do that with a pure volunteer-based systems. 
Right now, the commitment alone for security support, as we do it right now, is already quite high, and it's already becoming too high in some corner cases. So um, this could only be done in cooperation with an external entity. I'll, and I'll skip a few slides because um, Michael's uh, part is also um, quite large. I'll only mention some, um, some of the more interesting issues. There are quite some non-Linux ports in preparation, um, notably the Hurt, um, the K3BSD port, and the Solaris-based ports. It will be pretty difficult to provide full security support for all these ports as well, because um, it would certainly be possible to simply recompile all the updates um, issued for a normal Linux port and simply recompile them on the new ports, but it will be fairly difficult to provide quality security support for all these because all these different kernels might um, induce completely uh, different behavior and it might very well be that um, a vulnerability which is a non-issue under Linux may be exploitable on Solaris, on the Solaris kernel, um, and likewise for the BSD kernel, and of course the other way around as well. So um, I'm not sure this is really realistic. Of course it would certainly be possible um, to simply recompile the, the regular security updates as done for Linux. We have quite a problem with embedded code copies. Um, embedded code copies are um, copies which a certain upstream has included into the software package. For example, um, the libav codec and libav format library, which has been embedded in quite some applications because um, the current version of, for example, mPlayer was in Edge, was not able to link against the system-wide copy um, provided by FFmpeg. Um, so this needs to be improved for Edge as well. Web applications are all also um, problematic. We only have the recent case of a, um, of a PHP package called PHP Mail, which is an interface to send mails out of PHP application. Although there's a system-wide uh, copy available in the archive, there were um, seven or eight other packages in the archive which include a local copy of this PHP mailer instead of linking to the system-wide version. Um, so this would, um, in the worst case, require to issue eight more security updates, and this really needs to be fixed. Actually, it's, it is already fixed by now because several bugs were filed, but um, one of the problems is that many of these embedded code copies are only noticed uh, once a security problem in the root software package is found because many maintainers do not keep uh, in advance that, uh, keep in mind that um, this may cause a problem. I think there could be a better cooperation with people providing um, custom Debian distributions or derived distributions. Um, of course, this cannot be a one-way relationship. So um, we would actually need to um, have some positive side effects from these derivers so that they're doing additional QA work for us or um, maybe pre-release testing or review of patches. Um, I've also noticed that several Debian derived distributions or live CDs do not have security support at all. Um, it might be that um, the overhead for providing security support on your own is just too, too difficult and just too error prone. So if we provide a better service for these, um, these Debian derived distributions which currently do not have security support in place, this will also benefit users at large. Then I'll um, close with some best practices. Um, we sometimes have problems with obscure patch systems. If you insist on using a patch system, um, please either use a standard one like dpatch, uh, cdbs, or quilt, or if you still insist on building your own handcrafted patch system, at least make it fail badly or make the whole, terminate the whole build if one of the patch cannot be applied, and um, please document properly how your, uh, how your um, package should be enameled. Um, there have been one or two cases where we actually um, only noticed a few days after release that a certain patch could not be replied. In, for vulnerabilities where we do not have a reproducer available, uh, which cannot be properly tested and only be fixed by source code study, this is a really difficult problem. So please be careful with obscure patch systems. 
Then we have a final help wanted session. Um, Michael will come to that, come to some parts of the um, security tracker. Um, peer review and double checking for that would be very welcome. Um, the PHP and um, MySQL maintainers also need a dedicated volunteer who's willing to support maintenance of these packages and especially helping with security problems. And you can also always um, follow up on open, secu on open security bugs in the BTS. Most of them are always tagged with the tag security. Um, so if you have time available, check open bugs, provide additional information, and see whether you, whether, whether you can reproduce them or which uh, suits they affect. Uh, now I'll hand on to Michael. He will talk about um, the Debian security tracker and um, the way we track um, security relevant information inside Debian. Um. Okay, um, hi. Give a moment for people to leave. Um, I'm gonna try to make this relatively quick because I know this is a long session. Um, but uh, so I'll start here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how some of these security issues are tracked in Debian. Uh, Moritz mentioned uh, much earlier in his talk about um, that maybe one DSA was issued a, on average a day in 2006, and as everybody here should know, a DSA is only released for a package that's in the archive um, and is uh, vulnerable to an affected uh, vector that is a known security issue. So how do we figure out whether or not a particular security issue is affecting a package in Debian? Um, Moritz mentioned a number of different sources of that information, but there's a lot of different um, publicly available sources of this information that are kind of haphazard and not very reliable in terms of getting, making sure that all the issues are covered. Um, so let's see. In 2006, we went through uh, the CVE database. Uh, we did this in 2005 as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is, uh, the CVE database, in a minute. But we went through approximately 8,000 issues that were known, that, and um, almost 6,000 of these issues weren't at all related to Debian. So there were quite a few issues that were um, uh, related to other organizations or um, were applications that weren't in Debian but were PHP or CMS related applications that haven't been packaged for Debian. Moritz mentioned the web applications and PHP being particularly problematic. Um, these numbers are kind of rough. They're based on the name of the program itself. So only the programs that had the word PHP or CMS in their name, which is actually quite common for PHP applications, were counted here. So there was quite a few more. Um, Cisco, we're not particularly interested in, don't apply to Debian, and Oracle as well. But you can see that uh, there are quite a few issues that aren't accounted for here. Um, but once we go through all of these and det determine what actually is as associated with the Debian package, we can see that there are still almost 1,500 issues that affect actual packages that are in the Debian archive. Um, and you can see this is about almost pi in how many per day that we have to deal with here. So. How do we do this? Um, I'm not sure why this is kind of pausing like this, but so we have this security bug tracker. Um, in some ways, it's like the BTS, but it's going through public, uh, publicly uh, released issues from Mitra and determining whether or not these are associated with particular Debian packages. Um, there's a web page here. I don't know if I can click on it to show you. But I'll try. Um, oh, you don't have Wi-Fi. OK, well, y you can load this at home. <laughs> uh, the page basically uh, processes our data. And we'll talk a little bit more about the data here in a moment. Uh, and automatically generates reports 
for the different suites uh, so you can look and see that what issues currently are affecting stable, unstable testing and old stable, um, as well as being able to drill down to the individual packages and see what uh, issues are affecting the individual packages and what versions of those packages that issue affects. Um, so this information is called from various data sources, but primarily uh, the issues are coming from the CVE database um, and then being cross-referenced with the DSAs that have been released by the security team. Uh, and additional information that security team enters or is brought in from uh, various mailing lists, known issues. Usually these issues end up getting a CVE assigned to them at some point and also issues that are <coughs> uh, discovered in Debian packages and reported to BTS in some sort or another. So how does this work? It's basically fairly simple. There's some uh, four fundamental guiding principles for how this tracker works and they, I'll go through these here really quick. Um, they're, this tracker is not, uh, people th seem to think that the tracker is a, a way to keep track of what uh, packages are being worked on by the security team to provide an update, but, and who is working on that, that's not what this tracker is. It's primarily to uh, keep track of vulnerabilities and weed out the vulnerabilities that are not ours, and then identify those that are associated with particular packages and the versions that those packages are affected. So the simplicity here is that there's a subversion repository on Alioth. This is public. You can check it out. And it's a t essentially a plain text file that you can edit with your favorite editor and then com commit back to Subversion. And that's it. Um, it's very simple. There's no web um, front end that requires authentication and ticketing and all this kind of prioritization um, that ends up driving you insane. So <laughs> this is essentially designed to be incredibly easy to do short amounts of uh, work without having to deal with a frustrating overhead interface. Um, the data that is in this list is comes from the Mitra database, which provides CVEs, formerly known as CAN entries. Uh, these are numbers that are unique, um, uniquely assigned to issues uh, after they have been submitted to Mitra. These come from a lot of different databases and from a community-wide effort to identify issues that are in various software packages. Like I mentioned earlier, Microsoft, Mac OS, everything is included in this. Um, and they bring a lot of this stuff from uh, mailing lists, you know, security mailing lists, bug track, Secunia web websites, and there are various members in the security community on this editorial board that uh, weed out uh, issues that are not relevant, although um, there are a number of issues that are not relevant that make it through still. So this is freely available from this website, and um, it's run by Mitra, which is a US uh, organization that runs um, computing research facilities for the Department of Defense, the Federal Aviation, Aviation Association, the IRS, and um, it is funded by the U uh, United States Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they're the ones responsible for the technical or fear levels that you'll get at the airport. Currently, we're at orange. Uh, <laughs> are you afraid? So uh, CVE is basically uh, this is kind of strange. They're basically unique numbers, as I mentioned before, for known issues, and they're, uh, when they're first put into this database, they're considered candidates only. Uh, and then after they have been confirmed, they're turned into uh, accepted entries, although this is kind of a wishy-washy process. There's a lot of the entries that maintain candidate status for pretty much forever. Um, although when something like PHP releases a new version and they mention in their change log that this fixes this particular CVE entry, then it becomes accepted. Um, 
I don't know why that's coming in in weird orders, but uh, the CVE, I'll show an example here, contains a brief description and references. You probably can't read that, um, but this is an example from the website for CVE 2007-2748, uh, and I can't really read it here either, but it's, the description says that it's a substring count function in PHP 5.2.1 and earlier, allowing context-dependent attackers to con obtain sensitive information via unspecified vectors. Uh, and then beneath that are some references to uh, change log entries in PHP, um, some mailing lists, archive entries, and uh, a couple websites where this is mentioned. So the description doesn't have that much information in it, uh, so a lot of the times in order to determine what, if this issue actually affects Debian in any way, um, we need to look at all these references and start tracking down in the source whether or not it's affected at all. Uh, just because it says PHP 5.2.1 um, and we have PHP 5 in the archive, it, we can't just automatically assume that this is affected by this particular issue because patches may have been backported already or various reasons have been fixed. So some of the, there are a lot of things in these CVE entries that are very difficult to uh, kind of extrapolate the genuine information and determine whether or not this is a problem. So there's specifically, I think, like I say here, how not to read these. Uh, there are, this last one mentioned PHP 5.2.1 and earlier. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean that PHP 5.2.2 is not vulnerable. And so we, that has to be checked. This one in particular, they mentioned in the change log for 5.2.2 that it was fixed, so it probably has been, but it needs to be verified. And the only way to verify that, of course, is to look at the source and look at the actual proof of concept or exploit itself to determine if it's there. Um, another common thing that happens is they will say that version 5.2.2 is not affected, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the version prior or all the versions prior are uh, also not affected. It's not always very clear, the versioning numbers, uh, what is affected and what is not, and the CVE team doesn't necessarily always know or put that much research into that. So we need to look into those in order to determine that. And then the fun one here is uh, when they say things like unspecified impact via unspecified vectors. Sometimes they'll say in unspecified package or unspecified program. Um, so these are particularly frustrating because it's not very clear what the issue is. And sometimes those will go away upon review or sometimes there's information that may be embargoed or needs to be dug out a lot more before it's actually determined what the functional problem is. Um, so there are some other systems that are uh, have been attempted to be created that are different than the CVE list that maybe are more machine parsable via an XML based language. Uh, there's a couple examples here, I won't go into too much detail, um, but they haven't really caught on because they have primarily just been developed by some private security companies and weren't really work, worked out within the community and nobody really knows about them. So they're who knows, they might someday be something better. Uh, the Mitra folks have this open vulnerability and assessment language, and that's primarily used for determining uh, system level vulnerabilities to issues. So uh, right now, the Mitra database is pretty much the best thing that we have, uh, and the most centralized and available um, and parsable data set that we can work with, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of improvements that could be made there. So part of this process of tracking these issues is that a lot of this stuff is automatic. We get these updates from Mitra uh, via cron job, just pulled into our subversion repository and committed. And then these are, of course, sent out via our commit list and spit out onto the uh, IRC channel pound Debian security that there's been an update and the data in this subversion repository is parsed regularly to generate this web page. Um, so all this stuff happens automatically and provides us with quite a bit of information already. But there's quite a bit of it that is not automatic and that involves processing 
these individual CVEs that have been released every day. Um, some days there's none that have been released. Sometimes they dump 20 of them. Sometimes there are issues that come in from 2005, uh, years later, that for some reason were not released and they suddenly release them. But in general, we, need, we go through and process these in order to determine their, how they affect Debian. So the entries in this file, uh, each one of the CVE IDs have a to-do line that says check, and we go through and look at it the particular CVE and try looking at the references to try to figure out uh, if this affects Debian and enter that information into the tracker committed into the subversion repository and then the tracking information on the web gets updated so that it has something useful. So an example here um, of a package that is not in Debian, uh, either not at all or maybe will be when it is um, packaged because someone has issued an ITP or an, or an RFP. Uh, this particular CVE uh, was for Apple Safari, so we changed the to-do line to a not for us and put in their Safari. So then that issue is dealt with, very easy to deal with because it's very clear that this is not something that will ever be in Debian. Um, an ITP we'll note in the, the file as having an ITP label and put the bug number for the ITP so that it can be tracked. And the tracker processes these and makes a list so we can keep track of all these ITPs over time. Um, some of these entries say reserved on them, and these are possibly because they are um, embargoed issues that haven't been released yet, are on vendor sec or a uh, distribution has a block of CVEs that they've allocated one of these, but they haven't provided the description yet of what the issue is. So this will say reserved, and later on it may get changed to something. Or some of these may get ended up getting rejected uh, due to not enough information or the upstream disputing the issue, uh, not, issue not issues at all, or mistakes in the tracker. So these end up getting rejected. So if we actually find a package that is in the archive that has been affected by one of these issues, then we uh, note the package name and the fixed version and a severity level. And this one here is gallery. These, this is an issue from 2005, so it's quite a long time ago. But um, this particular PHP issue in gallery was affected in the Debian package 1.5.1-2, and we associated a, a severity level uh, with this particular problem as medium. Um, the severity levels are relatively arbitrary. They're mostly used for triaging and determining the, the uh, relative severity and uh, how, you know, whether or not we're going to deal with this issue or not, or maybe the security team needs to make an update in stable. Um, they're not particularly uh, detailed here. Let's see. So some, some of these issues are not fixed, uh, so we need to file a bug on these issues, and we file a lot of bugs uh, after going through these CVE entries. And this one is a PHP bug uh, and affects multiple versions of PHP, so both PHP 4 and PHP 5 are noted here, and the bugs and the severity are also noted. Um, the tracker will process this information uh, and provide links to the particular bugs for this particular CVE in the PHP package, so you can drill down and see all this information very easily and conveniently. Uh, once we become aware that um, this issue will be fixed in PHP. We'll note the Debian revision number that it will be fixed in um, because uh, Sean will let us know because he's very good at that. And uh, you can as well. That helps a lot. Uh, the severity levels, as I said, are just used for triage and easier overview of the, uh, all the packages. Um, we also have different severity levels that we file in the BTS when we discover an issue in a package, but um, 
you know, as Mortz was mentioning, not all these issues are release uh, cr critical issues. So uh, they are put in there as these different four severity levels. And um, if people are interested in how we determine what these severities, severity levels are or whether a package meets a high criteria, we can talk about that later. Um, we also use distribution tags in the tracker to um, provide information about which uh, distribution is affected by an issue because a number of issues are maybe only affected in SID, for example, uh, or Sarge, but the tracker data itself is only targeted at SID. So um, with the distribution tag, the tracker is able to process and determine the applicability of a issue for the other distributions. Um, these are cross-referenced with a DSA list that we maintain as well, um, and it will automatically change and add the information to the tracker page when that um, when it's been processed and the DSA information has been added. This information is all manually added, so sometimes people will complain that the DSA information is not updated. Uh, that's just because it has to be added into the file. So sometimes this data can be slightly delayed. Um, here's an example of a Drupal issue that was fixed in 4561-1, and you can see the CVE description has some pretty crazy um, versioning numbers, but this one, we ended up putting a distribution tag of Sarge on it because uh, this particular issue, although you can't see in this description, if you look at the longer description and some of the reference URLs, uh, only can be triggered with PHP 5. And PHP 5 was not included in Sarge, so this issue is also labeled in the tracker, is not affected by, in Sarge. Uh, Moritz mentioned this, but we also, in the tracking system, we don't support non-free or contribute issues. It's just too much to track. And the embedded code copies is also a problem in the tracker itself, determining whether or not a vulnerability is uh, applicable to a package is kind of difficult when there's a lot of different copies of, of things in there. Uh, you have a question? Yes. We can take questions here in the end, too. We're almost Go ahead. Okay, I have a question to the PHP 5 example. Uh -huh. So you said PHP 5 is not in Sarge, so the package gets not fixed, or so the two uh, packages? If I can go back here, I'll, I'll show you that it's just noted that this package Drupal is not, uh, it's not affected in Sarge. But it's also noted right above it that Drupal version 456-1 was uploaded into SID. So this version fixed this issue in SID and then it propagated to testing. But it's not fixed in Sarge. So if anyone yeah. has um, .dev PHP 5 packages, own fault. Right, we, we can't support people installing packages that aren't supported by Debian. So if you install a backported PHP 5 from .deb.org or whatever, it's not something that we can track. It's just too much information as it is. <clears throat> um, yeah, so these are particularly problematic. I'd call them evil. Um, we have a list in our Subversion repository of the packages that we know that embed code copies and what those code copies are. Uh, we don't know all of them because we only end up uh, finding them once we have actual vulnerability that tend has something like the libxpdf uh, library embedded in it, and then we start discovering that that's embedded in a number of different packages. So then we note this in our file so that next time there's a problem with libxpdf, we make sure we check all these various packages. Um, this is a, really a problem and very annoying. So um, it, it's a, something that we've maybe thinking about uh, making a uh, release criteria for Lenny is getting rid of embedded code copies. Uh, there are a lot of issues where embedded code copies are legitimate, so there has to be exceptions, and these have to be kind of detailed before that makes any sense. Um, I believe we've submitted a bug to the policy um, documentation about this issue because this is a significant problem for the tracker as well as for maintaining the security 
packages and doing updates. Um, if you don't believe me, try finding all of these in the archive and which packages they are. It's not very fun and it's not very easy. <laughs> and once you do find them, it, you have to go through every package to determine whether or not it's vulnerable to the issue. If any one of these tiny MCE JavaScript library or whatever is uh, affected by a vulnerability. So all this data, when we process it, um, gets turned into this security bug tracker page automatically and uh, this page and this data is processed by this Deb Secan software. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce that properly. Uh, but this is a, a package that you can install in your system and it will query this tracker data and let you know what uh, packages that are installed on your system are affected by what vulnerabilities that Debian knows about. Um, this is particularly useful if you are uh, wanting to deal with, uh, if you have a, a package on your system that you want to disable, when there's a remote code execution or privilege escalation, you'll get an email letting you know that we've determined that this issue actually exists. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean it's fixed yet, but you can look in there and track that uh, fix as it propagates through the archive. Um, it's a little noisy at the moment, this uh, program, because it tells you all the vulnerabilities for like the Linux kernel um, will tell you if there's a vulnerability in the Linux image, it, it's also in the Linux headers and all these other packages, so it gets listed more than once. This is something that we hope to improve over time, so it's more useful. Um, other tools could also use this data like uh, Nessus scanners or whatever to get more accurate data and reduce some of the false positives that they tend to have. Um, you guys as maintainers can use this information to uh, keep updated, keep us updated on the security information in your packages, letting us know what versions uh, issues were fixed in. Um, the release team can use this to see the state of the uh, various suites and their security issues. Um, and you can also use this information to get security history of a package. Uh, the kernel itself I mentioned just earlier is tracked outside of the system at the moment because uh, in Woody the number of kernels were so large it was really cumbersome and difficult to process this data in the tracker. So uh, we came up with a different method of tracking this. Uh, it's in the kernel subversion repository. And I don't have the internet here so I can't load it up. but. Uh, uh, this page is actually, uh, Micah. That's moved. We are now sharing uh, an oh, Alioth yeah, right. project. It's a. It's called kernel sec. Yeah, so it's also on on svn.dev.org. Right. My uh, the versions of the slides that are on my computer that weren't displaying on the screen have that corrected. But yeah. Um, so don't try to load this one. Although if you go here, I think there's a link to it. Um, essentially, this is a an effort that. Um, it's coordinated somewhat with Ubuntu. They also track their kernels in this system um, to a lesser degree. But uh, Moritz and Dan uh, fill out each CVE and whether or not it's affecting different kernel versions that we have in the different suites, um, whether it's in old stable, stable, testing, unstable, uh, whether whether there's a patch that is available or has been applied to the kernel uh, in the subversion repository and with the kernel team or not, or if this issue hasn't even been checked at all. Uh, it's a good overview page uh, to get a good idea of where things are at. Um, so here's some pretty statistics. Everybody likes statistics. Um, these are thanks to Stefan here. Uh, in kind of in general here, you can see that in 2005, and 2006, um, there were 15 to 22,000 issues um, that were in this database, uh, 7,000 more uh, in 2006. Uh, there are a bunch of issues in here that don't have CVE entries that we end up adding or requesting at a later date. Um, the not for us entries, which are the issues that I mentioned earlier that are 
Microsoft or Cisco or whatever that aren't Debian packages are quite large as well. Um, and then also here are the reserved and rejected items, the numbers. These all add up to, at the bottom, how many issues actually affect Debian in these different years. So you can see this is increased by 1,000 or so uh, in 2005, 2006. Oh, right, this is incorrectly, uh, the header's not correct down there, yeah. The, the third column is actually the 2006 numbers. Um, so this is actually a actually, mathematical the, operation. Actually, this was uh, just the way how I determined the data. So the, the first column is the status end of 2005. The second column is the status uh, end of 2006. and. And the third column is the difference, so that's the issue, number of issues in 2006 that we did in 2006. Yes, yeah, so the number of issues are actually in the third column there. Uh, so the number of issues that affect Debian in 2006 that we determined were 1,154 here. Um, total items were 7,000, and not for us items were about 10,000 items. Um, that's also probably not readable. <laughs> uh, but this was a this is a graph that a user on the mailing list submitted, uh, graphing over time the number of uh, security holes in the various uh, distributions. The uh, unstable one is kind of this reddish line. The blue line is the testing distribution, and the green line uh, is stable. Uh, there's this sharp drop here when Etch was released. It's, uh, there's something not quite right in the graph as this should be up here more. Um, but we didn't have time to correct this before the presentation. Um, so the last thing in the, I mentioned we had these guiding principles involved in the tracking these security issues. And the last one as maybe the most important one and people tend to have the most problems with is this issue of transparency. Um, this has been a, something that people like to bring up on the mailing list is the security team lacking completely in any transparency whatsoever. Uh, but this element of the security process is actually incredibly transparent. Um, so a lot of people uh, get a little freaked out about the fact that all this information is available f uh, publicly. Um, and one of the responses to this concern is that all these issues are already, the CVE issues are already publicly known. And uh, before they even become a CVE is issue, they have been published on various security websites, proof of concept, exploit codes, have been published through bug tracker or whatever. And uh, there's only a very small amount, maybe only about 1% that are vendor sec or embargoed issues uh, that aren't actually in the tracker itself. Um, so all this information already exists, uh, so it's not particularly uh, surprising that it's, we're also making it available. Um, and one other thing is that if everybody on the internet already knows, then Debian uh, sure is better know in order to deal with this problem. Um, because it takes a while for this issue to percolate down to the actual maintainer to fix the issue and get the fix into the archive and then the users to actually install that fix. So once these issues have been publicly acknowledged and put into a CVE, into the CVE database, it takes a while before you're actually gonna get a fix into your system. So uh, the sooner that uh, we know about things that the internet already knows about, the sooner that these can be fixed in the archive and on your system. Uh, and the mo probably the most important thing here is this transparency, about transparency is that this is really something that users and developers expect in Debian and what is really deserved as a project as a whole. Um, and it really improves the perception of the project to be as transparent as possible. Um, so there's some things that we were planning on doing. Uh, we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, maybe one of these things we'll do is add some of this tracker security information to the package tracking system, the PTS, so that when you go to look at a package, you can see the security history of the, the package. 
the data in the, um, the tracker can always use integrity uh, checks and improvement. Um, and this Deb CCAN software um, still is quite noisy, as I mentioned. So it, this could be improved so it's more useful to administrators of systems. Um, so how can you help? Well, this is actually the tracking security issues is kind of a, uh, a unique scenario in Debian where it's very easy to contribute in very minute ways. Um, and it's open uh, on Alioth for people to join and participate. You don't actually have to be a Debian developer to participate in this aspect of the security work in Debian. Um, so it's, and you know, processing individual CVEs can take anywhere from two seconds to determining that, that it's a Safari issue or a Microsoft issue or much longer uh, digging into that. So you can really spend very little amount of time but have quite large impact on Debian itself. Uh, so we encourage people to join us um, either in verifying your package's security data in the tracker um, or other information in the tracker. There's a list of to-do items in the tracker. If you're interested in participating, you can look through this and start sending us information or sign, ask us to add you to the Alioth pro project um, and start tracking this information in more detail. We're here uh, and we're interested in showing people how to do this in more detail. And there's some documentation as well in the Subversion repository on more detail on how to do this properly. And so if people are interested, we would like to show you more how to do this and get you involved. You don't have to do this every day if you don't want to. You can, you know, if 10 people do one, th one CVE every week, that's significantly more than what we're doing already. Um, and of course, fixing your security bugs, um, responding to the security bugs that we file, um, making sure that you include CVE numbers that we include in these bug reports in your change logs so we can watch these because uh, we watch the changes reports um, on the mailing list and update the tracker with the information of the, the fixed version that's in the repository. So knowing which version uh, of the package is fixed, we need to know that. And also working with upstream to isolate affected versions. It's not always very easy and very obvious. So if, if you know this already because you have a relationship with upstream, uh, letting us know will help us a lot. So that's kind of the end of how we're tracking things. I kind of blew through that really fast because I thought we might leave a little bit of time open for questions. We have uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. So Abba's got a question back there. Yeah, well, actually, I've um, was at the very beginning, Moritz said that a lot of packages where well, basically are unable to provide security support because the team is not helpful, upstream is difficult. Um, but if that's the case, it's already, according to our current standards, an RC bug. So I would really encourage you to file such bugs so that we can identify such packages and prevent them from going to the next stable version of Debian. Um, I sometimes tried that. Um, this hasn't been very successful in many cases. So. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I can try that again, but um, often, often, often um, the the short wish to have that package in the archive is um, for the maintainer more important than the general archive maintainability at all. I think it's uh, actually limited to 10 to 20 packages, which are always the same candidates. Um, well, if, if there could be some help from the release team, uh, of course, uh, that's a helping user. Yeah, I was planning to raise that during that. Um, how are 50k packages supportable um, BOF? So I think it's a bit disrelated to the current talk. Okay, so the next one is you said, there are some cases we prefer to not do updates to the stable system because it's just, the issues are too minor basically. And I've seen that such issues are being marked in the test, in the in security tracker as well. But for most of our users, they are just never acknowledged somehow in Debian. So how about perhaps sending out some well, we are not going to fix these bugs because they are too minor or something like that. Well, yeah, that's, that's the idea behind the errata, so um, that we have a, um, someone who's maintaining properly maintained errata um, so that this person can be CC'd. 
providing, um, sending out advisories um, for such minor issues is, uh, in my opinion, a bit, um, yeah, this would be, I don't, on the one hand side, too much work, and it would also take away attention from the uh, really important issues. Well, you could make it some of the ones per month or so, but we can discuss that afterwards. Yeah, it, it might be that um, it might be a good idea if someone maintains a router for a Debian stable release that um, the the delta between the last month is is sent out via email every month. That would be nice. Yeah. Actually, we already have a router. They are called. They are part of the release notes, so we could try to make better use of them, also for security. Yeah, but but right now they are um, mostly limited to installation bugs. Like um, S three hundred nine cannot be installed with floppy well, disk. No, we have two different things. We have an installation manual with installation errata. We have the release notes with the release errata. Like for example, for Sarge with something with if you're upgrading send mail, we have this strange issue there. And I think that's the last, so edge release errata. I think is the right place for such things. Yeah, it might so be, but it, I think it still needs a proper maintainer, which yes, can, of can be CC'd, so we need a volunteer, basically. Definitely. And last thing I want to say is, you said about the points, at least they don't happen so often. Actually, these days, proposed updates is already for the, uh, better usable for the normal people, because packages are reviewed before they are accepted into proposed updates. So that might be even useful now. I'm not sure how recommended it is to... Um, well, if, if you recommend to, to put proposed updates in the app source, if, if um, the um, stable release managers take that into account, that every package uploaded to proposed updates may, um, may only be crafted very carefully so that they not break things, that's certainly an option. But on the other side, we also um, had a problem with one sent mail update where um, the version, I think, in stable updates was, um, had a slightly minor um, I think some, I don't remember the exact details anymore, but it actually led to, um, to the fact that some people who had already pulled in the version from um, proposed updates had a, a non-installable package. So if this can be technically out, so sorted out technically, I guess that's a, that's a fix as well, yeah. Okay. Questions? Uh, you mentioned briefly you had some uh, collaboration with Ubuntu on, on kernel security issues. I wonder if you'd had any uh, collaborations with uh, other distributions because uh, a lot of the triage has got to be duplicated efforts, albeit that most distributions have far fewer packages than Debian. Well, mo most of this is um, handled through VendorSec um, because all the major security teams are present there. Um, Especially with um, regard to the kernel, because um, the kernel does not have um, a regular security management upstream. They have a security at kernel or contact list, but for example, they do not provide advisories to um, developers. So um, VendorSec is actually the place where um, most of these kernel issues are analyzed and patches are discussed and the status of patches is um, shared. So that actually takes place on VendorSec. Yeah, some of the tracker information, we, it would be nice to collaborate with other vendors, um, especially in trying to isolate uh, affected versions, because a lot of this stuff is very opaque. Uh, we've talked at some points about maybe having a shared repository to uh, you know, keep patches for isolated security fixes and use that between different vendors but it's something that requires coordination with the different vendors, and so far that hasn't ha manifested in any way. But it's yeah, definitely something that's useful. And for the kernel tracker in particular, we were talking, I guess Tuesday or whatever, about maybe being able to get rid of our participation in that and going back and just using the standard tracker. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we have the kernel tracker is because there's an outlandish number of different versions of the kernel in Woody, and then Sarge we got down to two, but there's still various architectures. Now that we're down to one or two um, packages that build for all the architectures, we can probably go back and use a regular tracker. Um, if, yeah. But if we got to the point where we had other distributors, Fedora, even commercial distributors, it would be great to use a tracker and I'd be happy to maintain both copies of the data. Um, because the kernel tracker is a very simple way of looking at 
um, a set of bugs and also be able to see all the notes different vendors have made. So if you know any other organizations that are interested in using this, just contact me. I'm happy to add them to Alioth Group. Yeah, I think once uh, Lenny's released, we probably can completely switch back to the, this tracker and get rid of the kernel tracker. I think we have to ditch Woody kernels before that. It can be really Sarge, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Sarge. I ditched Woody a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, uh, what was my question? <laughs> uh, so, if, so if you start, um, if Debian starts providing enterprise level support, uh, like over five, seven years, um, does that mean we would start um, supporting uh, upgrades between older than one uh, release ago? No. no? <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the practical implications for that are, are not possible because Debian is just too large for that. So um, this would actually boil down to, to a scenario where would either um, it would uh, only be limited to a certain subset of the whole archive anyway because um, you can't do that for 50,000 packages. Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, consists of significantly less packages than um, than Debian. And likewise, for example, if you compare Fedora with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, there's also a huge, gap, a huge gap in package size. So um, if that ever comes to reality, um, one would uh, need to define an upgrade path from um, one of these um, enterprise release cycles to the next one. But I guess that's feasible as well. Yes, my name is Peter Reynoldsen, and I'm uh, one of the person that was involved in uh, the initiative to start the uh, security testing team. I'm, I must say that I'm really impressed how far you managed to get uh, in these last few years, and I would really like to thank you all in the team for doing a great job in uh, bringing the attention of the project to uh, security problems and making sure that we actually make a good job at fixing them. So thank you very much. You are mostly reacting on existing uh, reports, security reports. Do you also have tools to proactively search for holes in, in the source code? And um, yeah. something like the coverity uh, reports? Um, you might have seen that I've skipped some slides because we're already at 70 slides. Um, and I skipped a few, but I'll put them online. You can have a look at them. Um, there, there is, I actually wrote my thesis about static source code vulnerability analysis. Um, from that I can tell that most tools suck. There are a few com commercial ones which are quite successful. Coverage pre-scan has, um, has a public setup which scans, I think, a couple hundred um, public um, uh, important, important um, uh, free software projects. But um, one, one needs also to say that um, from all these scans, I think only a couple really severe security problems were found. Um, these tools mostly find correctness bugs or they find uh, rather ancient security classes which are not really, um, not really relevant anymore. Like you, it's pretty easy to detect format string vulnerabilities, but none of these tools addresses integer overflows right now. And um, they, only, um, they are only able to detect a very small subset of relevant buffer overflows. So, um, for example, they found a local um, root exploit in X11, which, um, due to a typo, a wrong, um, a wrong function was called. So um, it was ended. Two, two um, conditions were ended. And um, thus, the function which made a, an authorization check always returned true because the other one, the other um, function was never called. And um, I think that's the only really severe security problem that has been found by coverage in the last years. It's mostly robustness and cleanliness bugs, but all these tools are not really suitable and do not replace um, proper, proper audits. If you're um, interested in improving the security um, of one of your packages, um, it's much more fruitful to look into fuzzing. So especially if you're a maintainer of some application which passes data, um, you could look into writing your own fuzzer for your media format. Or um, if it's a common media format, there might already be a fuzzer available. That's not to say that um, these scanners would not be useful. I think that if someone wanted 
to or a company offered to do this on the entire archive. Uh, I'm sure it would be useful if someone were to go through the uh, issues that they uncover and determine whether or not they're actually valid. Uh, I think there would be quite a number of false positives involved. Um, and there is this Debian audit team that exists that uh, might be more appropriate for that sort of work. Um, so I think it is information that could be useful, um, but it's probably will boil down to a very small number of actual issues. Anybody else have questions? Oh. Um, so, how many people right now are in the testing security team, in the stable security team? Uh, what would be the ideal number of people in these teams and why not merge them? Yeah, um, in the testing security team there's maybe, well you can see if you go to the Alioth page there's probably 20 people listed, uh, although maybe only four or five people are actually active. Um, tracking bugs, uh, Florian Weimer, Stefan, uh, myself, Moritz, and um, Sean is doing some stuff. And, and there are a few people that uh, come and go at various times. Um, but uh, Moritz had a slide with the number of people that were in the stable security team. I think it was five or six. Depends on what. Yeah, it depends, I guess, on, on Mike. Um, and there have been discussions about uh, merging the two into just having a security team, um, although it makes sense to focus on stable or testing because each one is quite a lot of work in and of itself. Uh, so that is definitely something that has been discussed and determining how to do that in ways that make sense is kind of difficult, uh, specifically with relation to the embargoed uh, vendor sec issues um, and whether or not everybody should have access to that information is kind of uh, disputed. Specifically, like uh, if you're not a Debian developer and you can be added to the tracker uh, Alioth project, then it, it starts to get a little questionable whether or not you should be having some of this information or whether or not it's allowable on the vendor sec list. But this is part of the reason why uh, AJ has made some of these changes to create the unembargoed queue uh, so that public issues or CVE known issues can be done uh, through that queue instead of through just an isolated queue that only people on the security, stable security team can uh, access. So. And it, uh, it's likely that we'll extend the stable security team by another member in the foreseeable future. Um, on the other side, um, this requires a quite serious time commitment um, and also um, a certain um, degree of experience because um, if you break X11 or Apache or um, other demons during, um, during upgrades here, you need to be quite diligent. And um, so in order to make this really happen, um, one needs to be quite careful. Um, but I think we'll extend um, by one member in the foreseeable future. Because the, uh, the archive is growing all the time, so it's um, quite uh, necessary to, to cope with that. But I think we'll run out of time. There should be a last question. We can deal with it. Otherwise, we'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah.